So seeing the presence of a quorum, I'm going to call this meeting of governance organization and legislation to order. It is, according to my watch, 1032. Um, this meeting is being recorded and pursuant to Governor Baker's March 12th order of 2020, uh, suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law, this meeting of GOL is being conducted via remote participation. Um, I'm going to just check and make sure everybody can be heard. And so start with Pat. Yes. And Lynn. Yes. And uh, Mandy, Joe. Present. And Andrew. Yes. All right. So all committee members are present and can be heard. Um, we're going to, we have three major items on our agenda today. Um, the first is the interviews. And then uh, we plan, I believe, to discuss and hopefully have a vote. Um, I've invited uh, Paul Bachman, the town manager, at 11.45 to uh, talk about the timeline. And if we're still engaged in our discussion, I'm going to suggest that we pause that and speak with the town manager and then go back to our discussion. And then we have uh, two resolutions, two proclamations, excuse me, that we need to review um, today, hopefully. So we've got a full agenda. Um, and I'm going to start with the interviews um, and just to make sure everyone's okay. Um, last time what we did is each uh, counselor was invited, each member of the committee was invited to ask a question. Um, they have a follow-up if they wish. Um, and uh, I'm gonna begin this time, I think, at the back of the, of the bus. I'll start with, with Andy um, and then move the other way, but I try to mix it up a bit. So I'm hoping everyone has a question in mind. Um, and uh, once that's done, We'll move to the next interviewee. Uh, we have three, and the first interviewee is Jane Scheffler, who we have interviewed once before. So I'm gonna, Jane is our first interviewee, and then Matt Holloway follows, and then Do Kim is our third. So it's in that order, and I'm hoping we can do each in about 15 minutes. So if we're okay with the procedure, I'm going to invite Jane into the meeting, and we'll proceed with the interview. Good morning, Jane. Good morning. <laughs> Hello. Hello again. Um, I think you've met everybody before. It's still the same old uh, folks. And uh, we have, uh, for the public, we've ha actually interviewed Jane once before, uh, a few months ago. And uh, she is a candidate for this position again. And so I'm going to, without further ado, I'm going to turn to Andy and ask him if he has a question for Jane. Okay. Well, good morning, Jane, and uh, thank you for um, sticking with us and coming back and showing your continuing interest. Appreciate that. Um, I was, um, since I'm chair of the Finance Committee, and it's also an opportunity to pose questions or thoughts to me, uh, interested to know whether you've had a chance to watch any of the Finance Committee meetings or look at Finance Committee packet material and um, if there's uh, anything that um, either intrigued you or gives you hesitation um, if you've done that. Sure. Um, I unfortunately have not had a chance to do that. Uh, it's uh, the last several months have been uh, very 2020 for my family and I. I'm actually currently in San Diego at my mother-in-law's house. Uh, we, my husband and I, just had twins in September, oh. um, and we came to. <laughs> yeah, thank you. We I mean, came to California <laughs> to have them because um, <laughs> they were born early, and so um, I've been keeping up with my historical commission stuff, but I haven't really had the opportunity to um, delve into watching any of the other. Um, available resources that the town has. Okay. Well, George, you want to? Okay, sure. Sure. Uh, Mandy, if you would. You muted, Mandy. I totally forgot I'd actually muted myself. So um, welcome back and maybe someday we'll actually get to meet you in person. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, and congratulations on the twins. Uh, Thank you. <laughs> the, the last time we saw you, um, you stated that you believed community members of the finance committee can be an additional, a, an additional link to the residents and give them a voice. 
Uh, can you expound on that in some ways and how, you know, you would work to make that vision and that belief a reality? Sure. I, I think um, that there are people who want to participate in local government, but maybe don't know how. And so I think if you know someone who's already participating, it's sort of an easy entry level in. And I think there are certain things that you feel more comfortable like talking to your neighbor about than um, say putting on blast on next door. Uh, and so I think there's something nice about being a community member. And additionally, because my husband works at UMass, um, meeting other people who are new to the community and trying to get their voices heard too. And so uh, mainly just thinking that, um, not that you guys aren't approachable, but I know uh, I would, would have been intimidated like 10 years ago, whereas I'm not now. And so it's um, just kind of just the opportunity to, um, to liaise between, between the community and, and um, town leadership I think it's mainly just because, uh, I'm sorry, <laughs> I did not have as much sleep as I normally do last night. <laughs> I haven't had any coffee yet. <laughs> but really it's just, I think it's the approachability of like, it's a lot easier to talk to, you know, to complain about something to your neighbor than it is to be like, hey, I'm gonna go write a letter to the finance committee about this. Um, I do think that we have people in Amherst who are very willing to have their voices heard and aren't aren't necessarily in need of talking to their neighbor about it. But um, I do think it's an interesting way to get perspective. It's just, you know, talking to regular folk at the playground and hearing what they're saying. Um, it's a little harder to do now with COVID, but. Yeah. Thank you. Lynn, if you have a question, please. Yeah, um, first of all, uh, we can all sympathize with you on uh, maybe you're also on the other coast. So <laughs> your time clock is just a little messed up for many, many reasons. Uh, yes. and, um, can you just talk about what you think are some of the major financial issues that the town will be faced with in the next year or two? I, that's, that's a big question. Um, I think just a few. <laughs> Um, I mean, I'm sh I know that a lot of the businesses in the local econ economy are really struggling because of COVID. Um, there's a lot of uncertainty as far as um, government funding of things, although I feel like um, given the election results, it, it feels a little less intimidating to think about what, what the budget of the, the greater United States looks like. Um, but we also, because we're an older town, we've got infrastructure that needs to be taken care of. We've got, um, with my experience on the Historical Commission, I know looking at um, things like how do, we, how do we maintain and upkeep some of our historic cemeteries without adding any damage. And so I think there's, there's this balance of old versus new that we're sort of always walking the line of in Amherst because we're we have got such a rich and deep history um and so I think it's trying to trying to navigate how we how we use the town finances to move the town forward while we also don't lose um some of these unique features that we have um with being such a robust historical area if that makes sense mm -hmm. Appreciate that. Uh, yeah, Pat, do you have a question? Uh, yeah, I'm actually going to build a little on Mandy Joe's question about uh, reaching out to residents. Um, at, racial equity is a critical uh, issue here in town on so many levels. So I'm interested in how you see yourself reaching out to the BIPOC community. Um, and, and how would you do that? It, um, Um, I mean, I think it's just a matter of talking, talking to people and not being afraid to talk to them and approaching them in areas. I mean, like I said, like, 
I have, I have a four year old, so we go to the playground. So it's, I talk to other parents at the playground, things like that. And we're very fortunate. The preschool my son goes to when it's not closed because of COVID um, is a very diverse, um, unique group of kids who come from all over um, and their parents are from all over. And that's been a really good way to meet and learn about other communities within Amherst. Thank you. Anyone have a follow-up question uh, or a second question they'd like to uh, to offer? Lynn, please. Yeah, um, actually it builds on these. And to, you mentioned that you are a member of the Historic Commission. Thank you for that, your service on that. Uh, and you also mentioned how, um, you know, being out in the public, going to playgrounds with kids, seeing other parents. Are there other ways in which you are engaged across the town? And I don't mean just with town, um, not just with town government issues, but anything with regard to the town. Um, so I have a book club that I started on Meetup that has, I think the last time I checked, 400 members in the community area. We do go... I do have members as far out as Vermont and Connecticut, um, but we've got a lot of people from within the Amherst, Northampton, East Hampton, um, that area. And that's been one way that I've really connected to people in the area. Um, I also have a running club that has much less <laughs> interest than the book club does. Um, but I've, I've been, uh, because we've only lived in Amherst for about two and a half years, um, I, tried to really hit the ground running with trying to establish a social network for myself. Um, and so the, the way that I've done that is through creating these two meetup groups. And it's been a really good way to meet other people um, in the area, um, especially in Amherst. Great, thank you. Okay. Anyone else with a follow-up? Uh, Andy. You're muted, Andy. Hi. Uh, so one of the things that I thought about is uh, you were giving prior responses is you talked about um, your use of playgrounds and how important they are with young children. You've talked about your uh, service in the Historic Commission and it got me thinking as you were saying that, I don't know, um, I think you may by now through the Historical Commission work have become a little bit familiar with the Community Preservation Act. And, um, you know, CPA is a uh, increment of tax funding that is a special category that has its own budget process that's a little bit different from the regular town budget process. And there are uh, very defined uses according to state law about how that fund can be used. And part of it is uh, is historic preservation, part of it is um, open space and recreation, and some of those funds were used for Graf Park and the Graf Park work, and then some of it is used for, um, it can be used for housing, and uh, so one of the things that uh, we as a community have to do through the process um, that leads up to to finally the council vote with the advice of the finance committee is make a decision on um, the, how to use the CPA funds most effectively to get the greatest impact for the community. You know, as, um, you know since you've expressed things that are touched on at least two of them, um, how, you, how you go about involving the community and how you go about thinking through yourself on um, those priorities? Um, you know, I think this is one of the things that in the town of Amherst, we are at a, a good advantage with, and that is we do have a very vocal populace um, who, who actively participate. That being said, I think um, having, because, uh, because of the historic preservation piece to the CPA funding, we um, at the Historical Commission will hear 
um, proposals for CPA funds before it goes to the CPA committee or around the same time um, to give a recommendation on whether or not we we agree that that's part of the historic preservation plan just to sign on to it. Um, and I think there, it's really interesting to see um, what people look at as important and how they want to fund it. Um, so I'm thinking about like uh, the North Amherst Library needs significant repairs um, and, and it seems like the CPA funding requests have been sort of for pieces at a time. Um, and so I think it's looking at um, how can we have the greatest impact in the community um, something like a library that's used by people of all ages, how do we make sure that we, we fund and support that without taking away from things like um, mixed income housing or low income housing to help diversify our community base. Um, so I think it's a matter of looking at and understanding what the town priorities are um, and then trying to fund them to the best of our ability and I do think some of that is just asking people. Um, and I feel like the town does a really good job of being transparent about what's happening with everything. And not just because of the legal requirement, but I also feel like Amherst is just very open and welcoming to people discussing and providing their opinion on, on how they want their funding spent. Um, I don't know if that really answers your question. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, no, that's helpful. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> so uh, unless there's another follow-up question, I'd like to give Jane a chance to uh, ask a question if she has one to, uh, to this committee um, <clears throat> about uh, FinCom or really about anything related to this whole process. So Jane. I... Um don't have any questions mainly because I've been through this process with you guys before and you guys have been very clear about how everything works. Um, and like I said, I just have not had the ability to really catch up on all things finance for the town of Amherst this year. Um, but yeah, I don't, I don't have any questions at, the, at this time. So Jane, as we have did last time, our hope is to, uh, after our interviews, have a thorough and robust discussion and hopefully a vote. So um, my intention is to get back to you uh, hopefully within 24 hours, maybe even later today, but within 24 hours and let you and the other candidates know what um, was decided. So um, you should be hearing back from me um, fairly shortly. Um, and again, uh, our sincerest thanks to you and uh, the best to hope you get some more sleep. Over Thank you. <laughs> and uh, congratulations again to you and your husband. And uh, uh, thank you so much for, for putting yourself forward again. Absolutely. Thank you so much. All right, Jane. Thank you. Here. So um, as Jane is being taken out, um, we're going to bring Matt Holloway into uh, the meeting. Um, uh, hopefully he's in the waiting room. And um, we're going to introduce ourselves to Matt quickly, and then we will turn to our questions. And this time I'm going to begin with Mandy as soon as we get that. Um, just to give a heads up. Hello. Hi, Matt. Good morning. Uh, George Ryan here. And I just want to uh, introduce you briefly to all the other members of the committee. Um, I don't know how they look on your screen. To my right is uh, Lynn Griesemer. Uh, Lynn is also president of the council. Um, we have Andy Steinberg, who is chair of finance. And we have Mandy Jo Haneke, um, who is uh, also Vice President of the Council and Chair of Community Resources. And we have uh, Pat DeAngelis, who is the Vice Chair of this committee. Um, so that's who is going to be talking to you today. Each one is going to ask you a question. They have a follow-up if they wish. And then when we're done, um, I will ask if you have any questions for the committee about uh, the process or about FinCom, since we have obviously Andy present as Chair of the Finance Committee. So um, our first of all, thank you very much for putting yourself forward. Um, we're very much appreciated. And I'm gonna begin uh, the questioning with uh, Mandy Jo. Thank you and welcome Matt. Um, and thank you for applying for this opening and all. 
Um, I'm going to jump right in. And we are, Amherst is part of a regional school district. And in your statement of interest, you indicated you had some experience with DESE and, and just regional budgets through, I think, Templeton and your work in Templeton. So can you describe how your experiences um, at DESE and in, in those other positions might help Amherst as it struggles with working with three other towns to agree on regional school budgets and assessment methods? Mm, good question. Sure. Yeah. Um, well, that is, I think, good morning. Thank you for the, for the question, Manny Joe, and thank you to the committee for the chance to meet with you all and to be here. Um, it's, it's exciting and it's a wonderful, it's a wonderful town. Um, so in terms of uh, regional school district work, um, I, I'm a special education director. And so that's what I do here in Narragansett Regional, which is a two town district, Templeton and Phillipston. Um, I've also worked in a single municipality in, in Greenfield as a special ed director. Um, so it's, it is a position as you know, this committee no doubt is aware where um, some of the largest line items in the school budget emerge from and, and oftentimes um, you know, without a ton of advance notice. Um, so so I've, I've kind of been through that process from the inside out, you know, presenting um, special education budgets and, and obviously the out of district tuition budgets um, to, you know, to school committees uh, and then indirectly to town council uh, in Greenfield. And, and you know, here um, we have a, we, our, our committee has representatives from both as, you know, as it does in Amherst Regional um, has representatives from both from both towns. So, you know, as a, as a municipal employee or a school district employee, regional district employee, you know, we report to the to the district, um, you know, to the to the district school committee. But in terms of, um, I think, you know, how I'd like to be able to support the the finance committee, um, I do think that you know I am able to parse out the line items of a school district budget in a very sort of concrete and pragmatic way. Um, you know, I, I tend to know what most, what everything means in those in those budgets, um, which you know it, it's it's. Obviously, it's, sometimes it's just a matter of asking the right questions, um, but it would be something that I would uh, enjoy enjoy working on from the town perspective, as you know, as a taxpayer um, and as a citizen, and you know, as the father of a child who's going to be engaging the public schools in, in the not too distant future. Um, you know, I have a, a vested interest in you know making sure that our that our schools have the resources they need to be successful, and and they have the right kinds of resources. Um, I did attend or or listen in on the. Um, multi-town meeting, I think it was, what, about a week and a half ago now. Um, and, and, you know, the Amher, the, our, our regional school district has a, a unique circumstance in that each town um, ha has a different approach to, to budgeting for its, uh, mm -hmm. its share of that school district budget. And, and I think the, um, you know, the necessary, on the one hand, collaborative relationship that needs to be um, supported across multiple towns is, is clearly key, but also um, a clear picture of what each individual, what our town can support within that budget. Um, you know, it's it's a it's a fine it's a balancing act. And I, as I said in my letter, um, one reason I'm particularly interested in this position as a non-voting member is that I can bring technical uh, expertise to you know to bear when it comes to you know the DESI experience is is largely grant driven, um, but you know grants can make a really substantial. I don't, I'm preaching to the choir, but grants can make a very substantial difference in the, you know, the financial health of a school district or or municipality for that matter. Um, but I think, you know, I think I would be able to bring technical expertise to the budget side of it. But I, but there are the nuances of multi-town relationships and and business uh, relationships are subtle enough that I'd be happy to be a non-voting member and to learn from the experience that's on the FinCom. Um, and, and, you know, provide my, my technical perspective, you know, when needed. So, so I think that that would be the lens that I would come at this with. And, and I think I could be, um, just because, you know, this sort of work of, of budget review uh, needs to be discursive and sort of dialogue driven. Uh, I, think I, I think I could be helpful in asking the right questions, particularly when it comes to school district budgets, but, but you know, it, as, a, as a whole, the municipal budget. Good, thank you. Um, Lynn. Yes, hi, welcome Matt. And I'm glad you and your family were able to move to Amherst. Um, I'd like to have you talk about what 
what you feel are the major financial issues uh, facing the town of Amherst the next year or two? Well, I thank you and thank you for the welcome. Um, is it a cop out to say COVID? I, I don't know. I mean, I feel like that's, you know, that, that's maybe a little, a little too straightforward, but obviously, um, you know, sales tax revenues uh, are, are going to take a significant hit, you know, in Amherst and across all, across all towns. Um, I think, I think for our town in particular, you, you know, we don't quite know yet what the impact um, uh, that COVID is going to, is going to have on UMass looks like, um, but it's going to be very substantial. And, and I, you know, I, I know that there's, again, this is another area that I'm happy to be non-voting. Um, I know there's a very delicate, you know, dance between the town and, and UMass and the other schools. Um, but, but I also know what a huge economic driver um, those schools are, particularly the university. And so I, I'm very worried about, you know, what, what COVID is going to do to, uh, you know, not only tax revenue and such from, from the university and the businesses, but, but employment. You know, I think that there's a, um, there's a multi-wave uh, impact on employment that is falling from this pandemic that, you know, we've certainly seen some really intense initial waves, but I think there will be repercussions, you know, coming down, down the line that, um, in some ways are, are scarier because, you know, obviously so much of the Amherst tax, tax base is faculty or, you know, other, other professional level positions at the university. And, you know, as, as the financial impact is felt um, across the university system, you know, I, I, do, I do worry about our citizens in terms of, of you know, being employees of the, of the university. Um, other factors, you know, are, are always demographic trends around school children. I know that the the town is aging. I know that the school choice numbers have not been going um, in the right direction. And, and by the way, I, I'll also say that the homeschool related issues um, are not unique to Amherst in any way, other than, you know, because we are sort of an academic educational community, we may have more families that are, um, that feel confident in their ability to homeschool, should we put it, uh, you know, but I think, I think that's, that is not a, an issue that we're alone or unique in. And I think it's something that you know, I mean, we have an extraordinary, and, and from a lot of different lenses, public school system in town. Um, and I think that the strength of that system will, will help us rebound from the homeschool and school choice and charter movements that are, you know, that are, that are currently happening and um, particularly homeschool being more acute, you know, during the pandemic. Um, so I think those are some of the, the biggest things that I would flag. And then, you know, obviously I would have a lot of learning because there's, there's additional factors uh, under the hood that I probably am not aware of, that I'm certainly not aware of. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah. Pat. Yeah, thank you. Welcome, Matt. Um, uh, racial equity is uh, something that we've embedded in the values of the town, uh, and we're trying to honestly uh, <laughs> make that a reality uh, across the board in, in all of our work. So, and you've said several things that intrigue me about collaboration and, um, but I'm interested in how you would look, what tools would you bring to look at financial issues, um, thinking about racial equity and, um, and how would you, how, what would, how would that look? What would your process be to determine the impact on parts of our community also that are socioeconomically uh, disadvantaged? And how do you see those impacting decisions you would want the finance committee to make? Thank you. Thank you for the welcome, Pat. And this is a, this is a very tough question. Um, it, and, and, and like you said, you know, it's, it's an important one to grapple with and look to making things a reality. You know, it's, it's um, so at the state, at DESC, I, I was uh, lucky enough to be involved in several different um, state and federal driven uh, policies around trying to diversify the workforce, uh, enhance um, equitable outcomes for, for racially diverse student groups uh, and, and economically diverse as well. Um, so, I mean, this is an area that I've, I've put a lot of time and work into, into from a public policy perspective um, and have seen how hard it is to translate policy into outcomes for, for, human, for human beings. Um, 
I'm also, you know, this is another area where I'm, I'm interested in learning sort of the, the norms and the working routines of a town finance committee uh, insofar as, you know, agenda setting versus, you know, sort of playing a legislative oversight role. Um, you know, I've, I've gotten to know Paul a little bit just through the, you know, uh, being involved in a couple other um, town, town committees and such. And, and I, you know, I see how much of his time and, and effort is dedicated to, you know, trying to make a reality out of some of these racial justice priorities. Um, and so I, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to skirt the question by saying that the finance committee, you know, is the, the role is to sort of provide support and oversight to the town manager, because, you know, I, I know that we have a charter that is set up um, with a more, I think, more legislative um, power than, than you would find, in, you know, in some other towns of our size. Um, but I also think that, you know, because the town manager is the one who proposes that initial budget um, and because, you know, he has clearly heard loudly the, you know, the call to promote right, racial equity through, through our budget, um, I think, you know, the, the importance of, of, a, of the town council and of a subcommittee, it really is to, you know, help, help sort of talk through and, and envision, you know, what are, the, what's, what are the odds of success for these various things that are being promoted? Um, and I, and I, obviously I know that a lot of, you know, initiatives arise out of the le legislative body, um, but I really think for them to take shape and to take action, you know, it, it's, it's a lot of a support role, support and oversight, you know, to the administrative branch. Um, so, so that, you know, that being, I just, I want to say that first because I, I want to be, you know, cautious about the, that sort of legislative administrative balance that needs to be struck. But, but I also will say that, um, you know, and, and, uh, I thought I thought Steve Schneider might be here, but but you know I, I'm in um, I'm in District Four, and we had a presentation on the forty uh, the forty R overlay um, zone last forty R forty D. I'm sorry, forty R. All right, it is R. Thank you. So you know we had a presentation on that the other day, and I think you know some of those moves towards um, responsible high density housing uh, can can can. But again, this is an area where policy doesn't automatically translate into outcomes. But but you know, having um, a, a thoughtfully crafted, you know, housing density zone um, uh, zoning can can you know promote racial equity. However, you know, it also it doesn't have to. It doesn't mean it's necessarily going to happen. Um, and so I think a lot of the things that that a legislative body can do um, to promote racial equity have to do with representation and, and you know prioritizing. Um, diverse members of that body and, and you know and I and I've seen just sort of from the sidelines Amherst making a lot of effort towards that um, in terms of representation um, but I but I, I think a lot of it you know is also in, in messaging and, and in sort of making direct outreach to the pockets where where racially diverse uh, people currently live in town um, and making sure that the town is a welcoming uh, destination for for families and individuals who are you know, who are racially diverse. I mean, I think, you know, being in the Pioneer Valley and being on this pipeline with Springfield and Holyoke and Chicopee and, and other more diverse towns, you know, near and cities nearby uh, means that, you know, we, we can be a destination for, you know, families that are, they're looking to move into, uh, for, for all the various great reasons people come to Amherst. Um, and I would love to see, you know, some of the demographic numbers on, you know, who moves here. I mean, are we seeing a racially what is the racial makeup of, of the new residents of town versus um, sort of the historical, you know, people who've been here for a long time? I think that'd be a, an important question to, to look at as well. Thank you. Thank you. Andy. Well, welcome. Um, as chair of the finance committee, um, at some point you might have questions that you want to ask of me too. And I think that George will provide that opportunity later. I was wondering, I guess I'm gonna cheat and uh, build two questions, uh, really make this two questions. And that is, one is whether you've had a chance to look at um, any of our meetings um, and uh, um, have, um, or materials related to meetings and have any thoughts about how the finance committee is performing and structured. And if so, what intrigues you about it and uh, the other piece, the, the other question is uh, one of the things, budgets ultimately are about choices and uh, we're constantly confronted with how much to put into capital, how much to put into operating and within each 
how you weigh the various demands for public safety, um, public works, and um, education libraries, and how, how what processes the finance committee can engage in to make sure that it's hearing from the public on those uh, priorities. Yeah, thank you for the welcome. And um, I, I certainly have uh, enjoyed reviewing the materials on the finance committee. And I do have a sense, I mean, I've, I've looked at a number of the presentations that you've made to the whole council. Um, and, then, and then just in a handful of email exchanges with George setting up, uh, Councilor Ryan setting up this interview, gotten a sense of, you know, the cadence of, of your meetings and, you know, how the budget site, because obviously, you know, the finance committee meetings are, are going to be a creature that is born of the budget cycle itself. And so, you know, getting a sense of, of how that works. Um, I have not actually gone back and watched any recordings and, and I'd like to, because that was part of the question I was going to ask you, um, you know, related to sort of um, the sort of the mode of discourse. I mean, you know, I've sat with enough finance committees to know that they're, you know, for, for the, um, department head or, or whoever is sort of presenting the proposed budget, there can be anything from, I think, maybe a, a thought partnership collaborative approach at that table to, you know, dare I say, uh, inquisitorial style, you know, uh, um, and, and it can be an intimidating process. And, and I'm going to go ahead and guess that you don't run a very intimidating and, and inquisitorial um, process. But, but I think, you know, in a town like ours, it's, it's a rigor, it's clearly going to be a rigorous process. And, and values driven. And so, you know, I, I, I am, I'm very much drawn to the finance committee in particular. And it's interesting that you, that you made reference to the um, choices, you know, budgets being, being representative of choices. Um, because I, when you started that, I thought we were going towards sort of, there's a, there's a saying that, you know, budgets reflect values. Um, and I think maybe that's maybe the next step, right? That, you know, that the budget is, is really a sequence of choices and those choices have to be driven by, by values. Um, and the, you know those values are, in fact, you know should should slash must represent you know the values of the committee as a whole, uh, the community as a whole. So, you know, bringing in community voice into that into that thought process, I think, is is really essential. And you know, I, again, having only been a resident of the town for a little over a year, I've seen enough public comment periods at town council at school committee to know that. Um, you, you know, as the previous interviewee said, I mean, our, we do have a very vocal and, and um, passionate, you know, populace in Amherst, and, and I know that they make their, their opinions and positions heard clearly. Um, oh, in fact, I did, I, I, I misspoke. I actually sat in on the last finance committee meeting. <laughs> I forgot. I forgot. Um, I, I'm on a lot of Zooms these days. So, so I, I did hear, you know, people coming in with the defund the police, you know, position in those meetings. And, and specifically, I mean, you know, that's, I think, indicative of a well-educated, resourceful uh, community where folks know that it's, it's not enough just to put that sign out in my yard. I'm going to find out which committee is making this decision, and I'm going to go to that committee and, and you know, speak my mind at that time. So um, on the one hand, I think that, you know, we are sort of in the driver's seat in terms of having a very educated, informed, resourceful community. On the other hand, you know, I, I always worry that um, the the, the voices that need to be heard are not always the ones who speak up, are not always the ones who step up and make sure that they're being heard. So, so I think that, you know, um, and again, uh, within sort of the confines of the, of the town charter and open meeting law, I, I think, you know, it, listening sessions and, and going out to communities and, and making, you know, making a proactive outreach attempt to the committees, communities that we're trying to help is, is essential to this kind of work. I don't actually know if that's realistic within the finance committee's charge, but but I think it's it's important work to do, and I think there's no you know no effort is ever wasted when you're when you're seeking community um, input, even if nobody shows up, you know you still made the effort, and that still counts for the for the public body. Um, so I guess those are some of my thoughts. The the one thing I wanted to kind of close on um, on that on that topic is, you know, I I did join the cultural council. Um, last month and you know we've had a couple of preliminary meetings there and and you know it, right now it's just an interesting time to get to know folks and, and um, applications are coming in and, and there's sort of just an ongoing dialogue uh, but one comment that was made at, a, at one of our meetings has stuck with me ever since and it has to do with sort of the the values of, of Amherst as a community 
you know, of us being a, an academic and an educationally driven oriented community um, and how culture sometimes takes, takes a back seat to um, issues of, of racial equity, social justice, sort of, you know, the things that you would expect out of a, of a left leaning community are there but a lot of the, you know, a lot of the emphasis and investment in, in culture is not. And I don't know, that just, that just, it, it, it rung true to me, but being new enough to this community and not really, you know, not having been here for that long, I'm, I'm interested to see how that perception, how my perception of that, you know, evolves over time. Um, but but I, I will be very interested to see what kinds of um, cultural items, you know, make their way into our, into the proposed budgets and and what the finance committee, you know, how the finance committee treats those, because, you know, it's true. I mean, if, if one thing gets money, that means another thing may not. This is, this is a, this is in fact a zero sum kind of a um, game sometimes. Matt, I'm going to give you a chance, unless one of my colleagues has a, a very important follow-up question. We're a little pressed on time here. Um, if you have a question or questions for the committee. Yeah, I mean, my, my question actually, which which has already kind of come up, but I, I would be curious a little bit, um, just in terms of the sequence, you know, from a legis like being part of a legislative body, the sequence of um, relationships or 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 decisions, is, it's not so much just I know I know how the decision making authority is, is is written, but you know, from a non voting member, who I who I envision to be somebody who is a discursive. A member of, of a discursive process where the budgets are presented and, and we talk about them uh, to the voting members, you know, who actually would, would make the vote and, and make the recommendation to the council and then to the council as a whole. Um, you know, what is the most harmonious way for that for that sequence to function? In other words, you, you know, um, what throws it off? Like what, you know, what, what, what can happen in the finance committee, particularly with a non voting member? What can happen to throw off the overall sort of harmonious functioning of that, of that sequence of, of getting a budget passed. Andy, I think that one is really in your court. Um, it's gonna we'll wait to see if Lynn is council president. Has maybe, any maybe Lynn has a thought there, I don't know. Andy, why don't you go first and I might <laughs> Yeah, um, you know, we're relatively new council because we just adopted the charter. And it's been interesting for me to watch how the uh, function of the uh, finance committee sit resident members is working within the committee. Uh, and, you know, the charter commission as it developed the charter and put that proposal in, I'm not sure, um, you know, had a vision, but I'm not sure, you know, it has been a, a work in progress to make it happen. Um, what we've kind of evolved to, and I think it was evident at that last meeting, if, you, if the meeting that you saw was our most recent meeting where we were reviewing the draft of the um, guidelines that, um, you know, it, it at this point where we are is that the resident members are really functioning fully as members of the committee when we have a discourse about the um, what is going to be recommended to the council it is uh, the full committee um, in, that is working together and uh, while the final vote by the charter has to be just the um, councilor members. Uh, we really make sure that we are getting the, uh, the voice of all committee members and uh, that uh, we're respecting that the resident members come to the committee in a different way, but uh, you know, function together as a group and um, try and make it be a group process. And, uh, you know, I think that, I think that we've uh, evolved in a good way on that. Uh, Pat also has been an observer of this and is a member of the committee and she might have some thoughts on that too. Well, I was just gonna say something very similar. To me, there is no difference 
during the deliberative process uh, and, and the idea of collaboration um, in the committee is very, the standard of collaboration is high. So uh, I, I personally think they should be able to vote um, but it doesn't matter because their voices are really heard and they do affect different people on the council. And so I, I think um, I, it's a very good process, no matter what position you hold. And I only want to say two points. Uh, first of all, Matt, thank you for telling us that you were at the last finance committee meeting. I remember seeing your name in the audience and mm -hmm thought to myself, who is that person? <laughs> and, um, and second of all, I agree with what Pat and Andy are saying. I think the one of the things that residents, non-voting members of the council who are residents bring is often a fresh perspective that is just not, not always um, in the council members' minds. And whether they vote or don't vote, we have had a terrific experience with non-voting members of the Finance Committee uh, in terms of how they have learned the process, weighed in, and feel very comfortable voicing where they're coming from. So um, if there's any disharmony, it's not necessarily among the committee members. It's more when somebody might come before the council and not be as fully prepared with all the answers that we need so that our questions end up feeling a little more like we're probing versus listening. Okay. Unless there's some pressing question either from Matt or from my colleagues, I'd like to uh, bring this portion of the interview to a close. Um, George, I have one just real quick thing and I don't, and that is <clears throat> Matt, uh, you probably observed that the committee is meeting um, in the afternoon on uh, Tuesdays. And um, I, if that's a problem for you, um, you know, uh, certainly you should let us know. Yeah, no, and that was one thing and I, I really appreciate um, George is preparing me for Council's writing, preparing me for the, for the conversation. Um, so we did, we did sort of cover the, the logistics, both in terms of time of day and also, you know, the annual cycle. So I feel confident that, um, you know, I have, a, I have a busy job, but I'm lucky to be able to make my own schedule more, or more, you know, more or less. The schedule is made for me, but I have enough control over it that I can block out the time that I need for this committee. I don't see any other hands up. Um, Matt, the, uh, we hope to, uh, as a committee, uh, after the interviews are done, have a discussion and hopefully a vote. Um, and then I'll be reaching out to uh, uh, each of the interviewees uh, within the next 24 hours, perhaps even later today, but you will be hearing from me very shortly. Um, and uh, you're also welcome to stay in the audience and, and hear us uh, do our business. But that is the plan. We also have a couple of other items on our agenda. So the committee is going to have to make some tough decisions in a few minutes. But the, the plan at the moment is for us to um, do our discussion and have our vote today. But um, I will get back to you one way or the other uh, within 24 hours. And again, thank you very much for taking the time and offering yourself uh, for this position. And uh, we'll be in touch soon. Absolutely. Thank you all very much. I appreciate it. You're welcome. So um, we have one more interview, um, uh, Doe Kim. Mr. Kim uh, will be brought into the meeting uh, momentarily. Again, we'll introduce ourselves. And um, let me think this time, um, I'm gonna begin with Lynn, if that's okay. Um, and okay. We'll, go around, we'll go around the horn in the same order. Um, we are obviously running a little late. So when this is over, we'll have to make some difficult decisions, but um, Again, we'll try to keep it to 15 minutes if we can, but um, I wanna give everyone a chance obviously to ask questions and I wanna make sure that the interviewee has an opportunity to speak um, fully. So um, we're waiting um, for Athena to bring Mr. Kim into the meeting. I know he's an attendee um, and well, his name is, well, hopefully that means he's being brought in as a panelist.
Hi, Adam has a panelist, um, but he's not showing up yet, so. Okay, well, there oh, he is. Thank you. you, Athena. Thank you very much. I think, Athena, we are set. Um, so I'm sure you have many, many other things to do today. Um, I appreciate you hanging in here. Um, but I believe that uh, with Lynn as co-host, uh, we should be covered. So as soon as he's appears and we can talk to him, I think we should be okay. Okay, Lynn, do you know how to move someone back to attendee? I did it just last week. I just okay. I remember how to do it. If not, I'll be texting you. All right. <laughs> okay, <laughs> sounds good. Thanks, folks. Nina, thank you very much uh, for your help. Mr. Kim, good morning. Hey. I'm great. We're running a little late, as you can see, but uh, you oh, are thank finally- Thank you for your time. You're welcome, thank you. I'm gonna introduce each member of the committee to you very quickly, okay. and then we're gonna proceed immediately to questions. At the end of that, I'll give you an opportunity to ask a question or questions of the committee, if okay. you have um, But I'm gonna start with uh, Lynn Griesemer, who on my screen is to my right. Uh, Lynn is the council president, also a member of this committee. Um, Andy Steinberg uh, is chair of the finance committee and also a member of this committee. Uh, Mandy Jo Haneke um, is uh, vice president of the council and she also is chair of community resources. And uh, Pat DeAngelis is a vice chair of this committee and also serves on the finance committee. So um, we welcome you and we thank you very thank you. much for taking this time. And um, we're gonna go right to questions. And I believe I was gonna ask Lynn, yes. Lynn you would be uh, kind enough to begin this round of questions. Welcome, first of all, and thank you for putting your name forward and providing us with this opportunity to ask you questions. Um, as we look at uh, the coming year or two ahead of us in Amherst, what would you consider some of our biggest financial challenges that we are going to have to consider? So far, I'm, I'm a daddy of the two students who are going to the Wildwood School and Wildwood Middle School as well. For Amherst Committee, as, as I experienced about 20 years so far, my biggest concern is try to build a school, new school in Wildwood School. So they've been, we've been boring about twice so far, I believe. Then one we just passed and one, not, so we're still waiting for the building a new Wildwood School for the remodeling. That's, I believe that's the biggest financial committee we have faced so far. And then based on that, we tried to make some bond because of the, we made some money, we made some revenue through the, generate some bond, but we've been rejected about twice. So I believe that is the biggest concern, Amherst Town, I believe. Are there any others that you would list on that list of? So we are, facing COVID-19 crisis right now. We've been, our town business is very bad. Also, UMass decided for long about, I believe about 70% of the employees is for long status right now. So based on two things, we are going to very hard time let's down over Amherst, also between of Amherst area so far. So we try to get some more revenues, but we need more benefit to our resident of Amherst town. That's we, both things we have to balance it. That is the biggest concern of, uh, I believe that's the financial, biggest hurdle in financial committee so far. Thank you. No, thank you. Mandy. Directions, George. <laughs> so, um, can you explain to us your, your statement of interest um, indicated that you had worked in a bust and accounting firm and some of that experience is with audits and all of that. But can you explain to us how that experience in that Boston firm would help you in your role as a finance committee member? So after I, I just graduated my UMass accounting non-profit organization and governmental accounting major. Since then I'm going to, I put on the, my statement, I working at the nonprofit organization. Now I'm moving to Boston Farm as a, I made a, some plan and conducting some auditing process for government to the institution which supervised by the governmental accounting standard as well. So that, that experience is gave me to familiar with some terms, accounting terms of governmental accounting agents. And then 
that also I can apply to the town manage town financial accounting because both things is cover on that's the only day government to accounting operation uh, standard board that they made us some rule so we have to follow that so I guess I'm very familiar with those terms as well so that's why I can familiar with of course municipal budget things and also I'm very I'll be very familiar with the financial committee that's why that will be my experience will apply to our town. Uh, Andy. Hi, I don't know if you were watching on the prior interviews, you might have been because you were in the audience. So I'm gonna ask a very similar question, pretty much the same way that I asked before. The uh, ultimately developing a budget, which is a large part of the function is to sort of, uh, advise, uh, help the council advise on priorities. And then when the town manager provides the budget to evaluate the budget that he's provided to us um, for council action, but budgets are about choices. And um, we all wish we had enough money to do everything to the greatest extent that we feel it needs to be done, but we don't because our taxpayers have a limit of what they can reasonably be asked to pay. So we have to make choices between educating our children, uh, providing libraries, uh, providing uh, public safety, uh, providing other kinds of community services, including recreation and senior services. How do we go about um, hearing from the community about what their preferences might be as to what is, and how do you um, go about making those decisions and advise the finance committee as a resident on what we should be looking at in those priorities? Always choice is difficult and uh, I, that is very, even my family, sometimes we have, we are not, uh, <laughs> I'm not very, so we have, every time we have to decide what's going on based on my budget, that's the same thing applied, I believe that's the same thing applied to town management as well. Because town management is a lot of people live in on the town, but making their decision based on their interest, but everybody has the very different interest based on their choice, because I believe because everybody has a different situation. I want to do this. I want to build a more school. I want to build more library. Or I, some people, some resident wants to, oh, I want to more focus on safety of our community. But all things are very important, but we have to decide based on what is the priority, what is more benefit to our resident of our town. So because of this, we need more consensus and more opinion we need more collect there. And then when we make the priority, which is best, and then we have to, how many, now we have to, how many residents we live in our town, how they more focus on their interest in on terms of the budget. So I believe that's the hard things, but that's, we need more because of the, we, town, our town is very small and town based. I take it out of my experience, but the budget paper, while I prepared this interview, we are very tight budget, but we have to we have to make some more collect and more we need more consensus among our resident. Then we can choose which one is more priority, and that's how we need more talk among our resident. Then we can choose the what is the best and benefit to our resident of Amos Town. Then we can focus on them, that's, that's the way we can decide. Pat. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, you've talked about using your financial skills and experience to analyze budget issues and your reliance on policies and values um, and residents consensus. Um, those are important things. I'm wondering uh, how you might use your these same skills and 
personal values as you assess the impact of financial decisions directly on communities of color or on residents who are economically disadvantaged? So, uh, my, so far, my experience is working at the profit company, which is farm. I have to generate some money. I have to make some revenue. That is, uh, that is more focused on. But from now on, I'd like to focus how to benefit to our resident of the Amherst town area. So my skill is based on the how is based on the now working at the profit, but now I try to make it more, give them more benefit. So I believe that's the same thing because I try to give them more what is priority. So I, my financial experience and my tools I, I learned so far that will be applied to the more benefit to the resident of Amherst town. That's I'm, that's I believe. Thank you. Thank you. So first, anyone have a follow-up question uh, they would like to ask, then I'm going to ask Mr. Kim if he has a question or questions for the committee. So um, I, I Lynn. Yeah. yeah, you talked about needing uh, more consensus and gathering of more opinion. Do you have some specific suggestions about how you as a resident member, non-voting member, but resident, of the finance committee would do that? So far, I'm, I spent about 20 years living in Amherst area since I was a student of the University of Massachusetts. I try to, what thing is try to first time try to give more gathering information as a, but I believe as a, Amherst town is consists of lots of uh, diverse city because, uh, because of the University of Massachusetts, they have a lot of international students and then also another group of coming from the another town or another part of the United States. So I believe we, I give, so far town has a lots of a way to gathering in, uh, opinion through the email and also Facebook pay, homepage. But I try to, I more focus on get gathering information through other social network system or more try to survey more than be, more than often, then we can gathering of some specific issue before we have uh, some vote. So based, try to, and also we are using, we now everybody has a smartphone and then we try to using smartphone and they have made, and then we can rely on that. We can gathering more information than before. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Oh, thank okay. you. Mr. Kim, any questions you have for the committee or for uh, Andy, who is, of course, chair of, of finance um, about the, that committee or about the process? So when I, while I preparing this committee interview, I have lots of budget archive and then a lot of papers you post on the MS that's just msma.gov homepage. I'm very interesting. They have, you have a very hard time to decide with what priority so far. So then we have some time we based on we now, we have to decide before December or when we have to decide next budget. I'm going to let one of the two members of the finance committee answer that. Um, there's three members of the finance committee. Three but members, Andy, excuse me, yes. yes. Yeah. Uh, the, the, the budget process um, follows a cycle that is established by the charter and um, state statute, which influenced how the charter is worded and developed. But um, in essence, we have a cycle that has a fiscal year that begins on July 1st. And uh, so generally in October, November, we uh, receive initial financial projections and sort of initial thoughts from the town manager. Then the council through um, at, after uh, with the recommendation from the finance committee will develop budget guidelines, which is where we are right now in the process. 
but at that point, um, they are guidelines. They're sort of like, these are our thoughts about the budget, but it is the um, town manager's responsibility to develop the budget and propose it to the council. Um, and uh, once that, that happens, then there's a very short period of time is that um, is provided the council on May 1st and we have a month to um, have the finance committee review that budget and um, make recommendations back to the council. The council's choices are to accept the budget or to reduce um, a portion of the budget, but it cannot increase anything in the budget. And that's how the uh, charter and the statute is set up so that it is a cycle. I mean, it has its pieces that work together and uh, we're, uh, you know, that's basically what we try and do so that the council and the finance committee are weighing in on several segments. And then there are other responsibilities that come along with the finance committee, which is to uh, review budget reports um, and to see how the budget is being managed through the year. And um, we also serve as the audit committee. I would add very quickly to that. And that is that we're setting up guidelines now, but depending on how things unfold over the next couple of months, we may have to revisit those guidelines. And we did that just last year uh, when COVID hit our community and the rest of the world. So there is an opportunity to revisit those guidelines, but we like to work with uh, in the schedule that me Andy has laid out. Okay, thank you. Thank you. All right, so um, seeing no further questions from the committee and Mr. Kim has uh, ex expressed his question, I'm going to um, put, uh, call this interview to a close, bring it to a close. Um, Mr. Kim, we, our hope is to, we'll see, we've got some timing issues to work out, but our hope is to have a vote today and a discussion. Um, but one way or the other, I will be back in touch with you within the next 24 hours, maybe even later today, and tell you what uh, the committee has decided. Um, so you'll be hearing from me very soon. And again, our thanks to you very much for stepping forward and uh, I'll be in touch. I look forward to talking to you soon. Thank you for your time. Thank you, everybody. Thank, Thank you me. very much. So uh, Lynn is going to um, move Mr. Kim back to the attendees um, category. Now I'm trying to figure out how I move him. So you go, there should be a more button on his name. Yeah, I've got that. And then you click on that, um, and one of them should be removed from panelists or moved to attendees, removed. or or moved to attendees or something. It should it should be one of those options. Um, I've got remove assigned to type. To multi pin, Paul. Yes. It's on the panelist list. Not it's not yeah. on the picture. Thank not you. on the picture on the participants window. Got it. Thank you. Okay, that should be done. Okay. Um, it hasn't happened yet, but well, well, he he's no longer moving, so it might be in transition. It's fine. Yeah. We need to make a decision, uh, the five of us. Paul has joined us, which is great. I asked him to be available as of 11.45. Uh, my grand uh, time scheme is completely in ruins. Um, so we need to, I guess the first very practical question is who has a hard stop today? The chair does not, that's just one of five. Anyone have a hard stop? Um, I think okay. I have one o'clock. Okay, well, uh, hopefully one o'clock would be. Oh, wait a minute. Yeah. I have a 1.30 meeting. Yeah, okay. So at least uh, it looks like for the moment we have the uh, possibility of going beyond our usual meeting time. My apologies to Emily 
Um, but I think that's going to be, if we have to stop, we will, but I, I think we can go beyond that. I think we need to decide as a committee whether we'd like to stop now, and I would prefer to engage Paul and discuss for a few minutes um, his thoughts about the timeline, hopefully about 20 minutes of that, no more. Um, I think I'll be a little bit more bold in cutting people off in this section of the meeting. Um, I felt a little reluctant to <laughs> interrupt our, our interviewees um, it, just in the interest of time. So I'm thinking 15 or 20 minutes at max. Everyone hopefully has had a chance to look at Paul's um, uh, email response to me. So I think you have a sense of what his concern or concerns are, but I just need a Let's sense- get to it. <laughs> so you wanna go ahead and bring Paul in and then we'll come back to this after we've had a conversation with Paul. Okay, very good. Um, so oh. Paul, very good, thank you. Um, Paul, thank you very much for joining us. Um, as I said, I have shared uh, the memo that, or the email actually that you sent to me um, about uh, the timeline. Um, I thought you made a very interesting suggestion that we may not take up today, but certainly will take up at some point about a two year um, cycle rather than a one year. Um, and I, hopefully my other answers were clear, but the, the, the core message that I got from you um, is the question of whether the timeline as it's current, as it currently stands um, would actually give you uh, or give anyone a, a complete picture, give you a chance to give a complete picture of your performance over the years. So you had, I think, a very real concern about, about that. Um, does anyone on the committee have a question about that before? I mean, I can have Paul expound on that a bit. Maybe that's a place to begin. And uh, or do people have a particular question they want to raise right away? I, I have a question as it relates to Paul. Um, the, the proposal for a potential moving to two years, um, I guess my question is, how do you foresee that working in conjunction with the charter requirement to annually review you, um, or you know, review your performance? I, I forget how the exact wording is. If we set sort of two-year goals, how do you see that sort of interim year and interim review happening? Yeah, no, I think, if I may, Mr. Chair, um, the yeah, I think the the charter is clear that it needs annual review. So I think you'd have to figure out a a one year review in between. I mean, you know, you may want to do it more frequently even than that uh, sort of check ins. But um, yeah, it's just a, an idea um, going forward. Of you know, a few years from now, the council might want to think, well, we're on two year terms. We should be looking at two year cycles of everything, policies, budgets, all kinds of things. Sorry. I, I guess I had another question that related to his comment too. Um, Go ahead. You know, we've been passing goals in like September that you then have to report on in July, essentially. Um, and you, you expressed some concern about this timeline that sort of rotates everything two months earlier. It still kind of is a 10 month cycle almost in terms of between passage of goals and then reporting on those goals. Um, I, can you explain, you know, or talk more about that concern of how that moving two months earlier with the goal was to get your goals passed by this beginning of fiscal year, but how that might affect, you know, you expect concern that that it might actually be worse than passing the goals two months into a fiscal year because of when so many of those goals might need reported on. So can, can you talk about that a little bit more? Yeah, so I think anytime we're truncating the year, either way, if it's goal setting not happening, not actually happening until after July 1, or the evaluation happening before June, the end of the fiscal year, is a, it puts whoever's in this seat at a um, disadvantage in terms of trying to achieve the goals. And um, so I think it's, you know, all managers want to achieve the goals that are put before them. So, um, I mean, I think that uh, the goal of, of the, the the mission of, of achieving, of ad adopting goals prior to July 1 is a good one. I just don't see that happening on a regular basis because of all the things that council has to do during the months of May and June. So already it's a truncated year. So you're really looking at a six month time frame. So that was the concern. It's, um, you know, I guess the, the, the reason, for, I, I don't really understand the reason for moving the 
um, evaluation period be earlier than July 1? I'd be curious. What, I don't know the answer to that question. Lynn, do you want to try and tackle that um, in terms um, of the, the rationale for? Um, yes and no. Um, I was the original developer of the calendar, yep. but after that, I all I did was bring it to GOL for discussion. And this issue itself was one of serious discussion uh, among the um, committee. I don't, ultimately, I think what we were trying to do was get back to unloading the month of August and yep. July and August, but other than that, and, and therefore trying to back our way into that. Um, and, but the issue, Paul, issues that you're raising, Paul, were part of the front and center discussion from mm -hmm. the council about how does that fit with really giving a picture of the full year. I personally am willing to revisit it. Andy has his hand up. Yes, I'm sorry, Andy, your hand has been up for a while. Go ahead, please. Uh, yeah, that's okay. Uh, I think that one of the problems that we've been struggling with with the calendar piece all along is there's so many different um, drivers to the process. Um, you mentioned uh, the cycle of election of council to a two-year term and how that then fits in with goal setting and uh, with evaluation. And, you know, I think that we're in a way struggling with that in our own discussion because uh, we recognize that for counselors who get reelected, they bring history to it, but counselors who come new to the council um, will have a lot of energy and a lot of thoughts that come out of their campaign and what they thought that they were trying to achieve by their election to the council and their desire for voice. And, uh, the struggle of how to make it all fit together because we also recognize that new counselors have a lot of energy and a lot of ideas but don't have a lot of experience and necessarily the uh, hard part of running a government. Um, I think that we're all trying to figure out how that works and how it fits together. And so uh, I know that's a uh, it's, it's more defining a problem than, you know, we were trying to come up with solutions, but I'm not sure that we came up with the right solution. And that's why your comments are valuable. Appreciate it. Paul, in your, the best of all possible worlds, if you could uh, just dictate this uh, calendar say this or just you know what your preference would be well, I, um i mean i think first off the to recognize that the the way this community does performance review of the town manager is a very arduous time consuming process by the town council so it's a it's a big ordeal um very few, if any, communities do it as as robustly as we do it. I'm not saying that's good or bad. I'm just saying to recognize that it's a job. So I would say if you were going to schedule it, I'm just rethinking this now, um, I would align it with where it fits into the council schedule best. Because if, if it's 12 months, it's 12 months, whatever it is, you know, and, and we'll get there. Um, and I think that you should say this is a good month or whatever time allotment you have for us to take this on as a council. Um, and, um, I guess that's, that's, that's one way to look at it. When is it best? For, when is it best for the council? Another way to look at it is to align it with the budget season with the budget year. We know that a lot of work gets done in June as people are, are driving towards, you know, they got to spend the money by June 30th or it goes away and all the work that has to be done is aligned that way. Um, 
So you could look at it on a fiscal year. And then the third way to look at it is um, to align it more with the uh, electoral the, the electoral uh, schedule, which is an, an annual or biannual, but you know every you know evaluate in December and prepare for January. Um, I don't have a strong preference for any of those, um, honestly. Um, I, we can meet whatever you is best for the council. Okay. Okay. Pat, please. Thank you. Um, Paul, you talked about wanting to wait uh, till the end of the fiscal year because it would be clear how you had met goals. Um, and for me, I'm often more interested in the process that was you that is being used to get to goals and how how those how your process in this instance is reflective of um, council values and and policies, et cetera. So um, why does it feel important to you to rest it on? having completed the fiscal year. Could you build mm -hmm. it? Thank you. Um, so if the job is to hire an economic development director by the end of the fiscal year, oh, that's not a good example, to do a certain project um, by a, a period of time, um, typically the, there's a budget for the project and that budget expires on June 30th, say. Um, not always, and um, but, but we, uh, we just know it operationally that a lot of work gets done at the end of the fiscal year, just like everything happens at the end of whatever the deadline is um, to accomplish the, the, the goals. So I'm, I guess I'm, we should look back at what the goals are and they're, they're probably not really tied that much to budgets. Um, it would just have to be pre before I presented the budget to you um, for, this, for this situation, which is May 1st. Andy, I can't, I'm sorry, um, wrong meeting. George, um, the, um, one of the things I find so challenging about all of this, and Paul mentioned three of them, but there's actually another one. One that Paul, the ones that Paul mentioned is, you know, when does it that fit in our calendar, align it to the budget season, align it with the electoral schedule, but there's also an issue of needing to align it with the town manager's contract. Mm. And I, we're not going to resolve this today. I, I'm just going to say up front. I, I, I think it's important to uh, have further discussion uh, with Paul and also with the committee um, and also bring in uh, other questions or comments that were made by other counselors. Um, the, balancing those together and looking at a complete rethinking of the, um, maybe, maybe part of the rethinking is what is the cycle on the town manager's contract as well. Um, but the other, the fifth one, frankly, is the election year, the election cycle. And I'm, I just, you know, I just know how we struggled as a council. I don't mean struggled. I think we actually rose to the occasion. But, you know, it took us a while to get our act together. Depending on the amount of turnover in any future council, it could take quite a while to get the act together. And I would hate to see the town manager go without any kind of long-term understanding of what at least past council's goals were. So I, I just throw in some additional um, pieces to the carfuffle here <laughs> that I think have to be considered. Okay, I see no further hands up. Um, Paul, any further thoughts or comments that you'd like to leave us with? I think Lynn is correct. We're not, I, I didn't imagine we would, but we're certainly not going to resolve this today. I felt it was important that it, you have a chance to sooner rather than later um, be present and, and express your concerns, not just in writing as you did, but also in person. And this is going to be an ongoing process. The hope is that we will resolve it sooner rather than later, but clearly not 
um, before January 6th, which is the next time we meet um, and have a chance to, to discuss this. Um, it sounds like the committee would like, I'm not sure if we need Paul present on the 6th because we still have some work of our own to do in terms of thinking through this, but I will continue to keep Paul abreast of what we're doing and certainly invite him back or give him the opportunity to come back um, before we uh, present this as a, as, a, as a finished product to the council. Um, because I think it is important that, that it be collaborative as much as it can be collaborative. There are a number of different, there are four different options we now have in front of four different uh, forces that are working uh, here and they're clearly not all in sync and they're not going to be, um, but it's important that, that, uh, that we hear from Paul and that he weigh in if he has any serious concerns um, because obviously this involves him very much. Um, so I'm going to leave it at that unless someone has any further comments, Paul, or Andy, any yeah, Andy 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 has has yeah, I had my hand up because, uh, no, I really appreciate um, what your thoughts were about decoupling the um, schedule for the evaluation from the goal setting. Um, and I think that's valuable to think about. I think that as a council, um, it needs to continue to look at how it does evaluations because I think that um, you know, we, we shouldn't let ourselves become um, the uh, slave of a process that was created under a former form of government, but should create the one that works well for this form of government. And uh, it's hard in Massachusetts, as I found when I was uh, doing some calling around on behalf of the uh, Charter Commission, uh, our open meeting law poses challenges that um, most communities around the country don't have. Uh, and uh, But the other thing that I think would be most helpful is to um, if you have comments after having given consideration to that issue I raised earlier about how goal setting um, works in if you do it on a two year cycle within the election cycle. I think that uh, is really where it becomes most helpful. And I keep thinking about that example and I won't give a name to it, but suppose a bunch the several counselors ran because of a an issue. And they want to express that issue and they have high degree of energy around that issue. Uh, how does that work? And uh, I think we sort of need to at least understand that. And so how you might think about that is, uh, as, as you ponder this would be helpful to us. Thank you. All right. Um, I see no hands up. Uh, Pat, I see up. Oh, Pat's hand up. It's down. It's up. Pat, yes. Yeah, Paul, this is not a question for you, but one of the things that you said is it might behoove us to do some research about how other towns do this. And I was one, and I'm perfectly willing to do that if I have a colleague on this committee also working on it, um, if that would be helpful. I'm more than glad to work on that with you, Pat. Great, okay, thanks, Lynn. I would just ask if Paul has suggested towns to look at so that we don't have to find oh. them ourselves. Right. <laughs> I can find out, and I don't have any off the top of my head. Yeah. The, the other thing is that this is something I think we can also go to the MMA and then give us some thoughts as well okay mm -hmm. okay all right well very productive paul i appreciate you taking the time um Thank you. And, uh, i think this has been very useful to the committee and uh we will be as we say back in touch but, uh, thank you thanks uh, paul thanks paul thank you um i want to bring just bring to the attention of the chair there is only one of the two resolutions we have to do today unless we plan to meet between now and the 4th of January. And that's the Martin Luther King breakfast. The other one, the Black History Month, actually can wait until January 6th. OK. Um, that's good news from the chair's perspective. Um, we do MLK today. 
Um, we could turn to that now and get it out of the way, or we can we can turn back to um, the uh, discussion of our three candidates for FinCom. Any preference amongst the committee? I'd like to get the proclamation out of the way. Um, okay, before we turn to the other. Yeah, I, I want to apologize to the committee because I did not, other than the dates, which then I made a mistake on, um, <laughs> I did not review because it's an, uh, it's an annual proclamation. So I'm going to be very interested in what George and Mandy, you found, because I did not look and I apologize for that. The other thing I would point out is if we're not going to do the Black History Month, uh, Council Brewer is in the audience and she would be available for that uh, resolution, but she might want to go on if we're not going to do it today. She's the sponsor. No, I understand. Um, absolutely. Good point, Lynn. Um, I think given what we have on our plates, I would prefer to postpone that until the next meeting, but that's just one voice. So I don't, I'm willing to, I don't know what the rest of you think. I also could reach out to her later um, with uh, some of the concerns I have. This is all just, you know, typing and you know, mechanical stuff mostly. Um, and she could look at that if she wanted. Um, so what are people's thoughts? Do you want to proceed just with one resolution and we'll leave Black History Month for January 6th? I would say if we can postpone Black History Month given the timing, because okay. we still have to make a decision on a recommendation finance. for finance. Right, yeah. exactly. That's my thought. So um, my apologies to Alyssa if, if that's why she, I think she's also had other exciting things to- So she has her hand up. Maybe she wants to make a comment on that. Okay, so if we- If Lynn would let her. Okay, I think, please. Alyssa? Right. You'll have to ask her to, un okay. Yeah. The <clears throat> Thank you. I appreciate uh, you recognizing me to talk when I realized your uh, schedule has gotten very crunched today and you knew this resolution was going to be coming before you today. And so, but I appreciate that sometimes things can't get done. And as Lynn uh, pointed out, this one could wait. I was concerned about it waiting very long because here's the problem. It's not going to make the, it's not going to make the December 21st. It's not going to make the first town council meeting in January. It's only going to make the second town council meeting in January, which is basically a matter of 10 days before Black History Month starts and the February 1st flag raising. So I think that given that it was ready to go more than a month ahead of time, it seems unfortunate to push it to being less than a week ahead of time that people will actually find out about it because of various scheduling constraints. So I think that we need to think about those things. If we think proclamations matter, then we think about the timing of them rather than just saying, oh, they're just a pro forma thing, whatever, who cares? We put them in consent and nobody worries about them. If we actually think they're valuable, then getting them out there into the public's hands is important, which is why I'm really glad you're gonna work on the MLK uh, today to again, make sure it gets out in the public's hands. Although obviously the annual breakfast isn't going to be the same, everything being COVID related. As to the wording in it, George, I'd be happy to have you tell me anything that's wrong with it, but I'm not going to change anything in it because it is the same thing that's been before us for like the last year, last year, three years ago, et cetera. This is not the year to fix this. We have plenty of outreach planned to various segments of the community based on my work with the reparations group. And it was agreed, as you know, via email um, that I sent to you before, well, in 48 hours in advance that um, additional outreach was going to happen before this possibly came to the you know, council for the next annual review. This is an out of date, somewhat stilted proclamation, but it is what we have and I have no intention of changing it. So you can either recommend it or not recommend it, but I will not be attending another GOL meeting to argue about formatting associated with it. I'm not quite, would saying that I misspoke, but I think I did. Um, th there are two proclamations on our table and it's the MLK resolution that I think has some issues of wording. Um, I had no issues with wording of the uh, Black History Month proclamation at all. Just uh, technical stuff um, that it, we could easily do today, but it has nothing to do with content or wording. It was capitalizing, bolding, punctuation, that kind of pe petty stuff. So and no issues. I'm sorry. I just looked at my track changes for the Black History Month and I, I agree, maybe we could do it today. Mine are mainly 
no. technical. There's yeah, no. one thing that's not. So okay. if that's the case, I think we should go ahead. Okay, fair enough. Um, do you want to start with that one and, and just uh, get it out of the way and then go to MLK? Sure. Sure. Okay. Um, if we can put it up on the screen, if that's possible. Um, yep. And maybe, Andy, if you want to put your version up. Um, I have a track change version as well, but my computer is giving me a big problem today, so. I can totally put mine up. Thank you. And let's look at it and let's uh, let's move on and then we'll go to MLK. So. I mean, I can start with my one question, which was the quote is not cited. So I didn't know where it came from and whether we should just get rid of the quotation marks, not the quote itself. <laughs> it seems <laughs> reasonable. So if the sponsor is okay with that, we could just yeah, delete sure. the quotation marks. Then there's a bit of punctuation there at the end that Mandy's noted that I noted as well. Um, and that's all minor. And that's true, I think. Um, we usually, capital, we usually capitalize the entire whereas. Is that true, Mandy? We've had different, we okay. normally haven't gone through and fixed it. It's right. just as long as it's consistent within the proclamation right. itself. Fine. So we remove the quotation and Mandy's done that. And, and then as she points out, uh, black should be capitalized, I believe. I think so. Yeah. Yes. As a, referring to a group. Um, yes. And Agreed. That, Agreed. Um, is just uh, the the our little rules about punctuation and uh, uh, the ands were missing, right? And there's no comma, but that's it, right? I think it's true all the way through. Yeah, the the whereas is needed, commas after them, and the and. Yeah, no, the whereas I, is a semicolon, isn't it? And then a no. comma. No. <laughs> Oh, we do such fun work. <laughs> I apologize to both to the, to the sponsor and to the public. <laughs> this is what we do um, at times. No, it's not the only thing we do, but we do do so this. I think the and does not get a comma after it. The whereas <laughs> does. That is correct. That is correct. And so Aunt Mandy has it right. Um, and <laughs> train changes, you know. Um, Consistency for the semicolon. Exactly. Tracking my changes oh. all the way. Andy has his hand up. Please. So the only thing that I had uh, that isn't the kind of small things that we talked about is where we have the third whereas clause, whereas the authors of these accomplishments, and I've looked at the thought about this over time, authors seem not the right word, but I I think that we're kind of stuck there because uh, we hadn't come up with anything better. And then I thought about it, so I would just pose one possibility, and if nobody likes it, I'm okay with staying where it is. But, you know, most people think of the word author as somebody who's writing something. Uh, whereas men and women who are recognized for these accomplishments in Massachusetts, history include the alternative wording. To About putting women before men. You can do that too. <laughs> uh, I don't, and I don't think, but I think the point was. Or recognize for these, yeah. Uh, coming up with something other than the authors and so okay. whereas women and men who are recognized for these accomplishments in Massachusetts history include as an alternative. Sponsor, have any thought on this? I have no problem with that. As Andy knows, we inherited this when we were on, I mean, the select board didn't inherit. We got it from one of our members when we were on the select board and we didn't fuss about the word then. And I agree that the word is awkward. And the longer that you do these kinds of things, it becomes more obvious which things are awkward and not particularly well-placed. And so I'm totally fine with the change. Pat's okay. version or Andy's version. Pat's okay, version. What we have is Pat's version, whereas the women and men recognized for, as Andy, excuse me, as Mandy has just put into the document. So very good. Any other changes? Because these changes, um, Mandy's changes track mine. 
I have nothing, as I said, nothing in terms of wording or content. It was just um, minor punctuation and consistency. Anything else? I, I had one at the very end, this now, therefore. Um, yep. It, the, the last just read weird to me, um, the whole sentence. So, you know, beginning with a virtual flag raising ceremony on February 1, 2021, with daily virtual celebrations and recognitions throughout the month, I just, I just wanted to word, add the words and continuing with daily virtual celebrations and recognitions throughout the month. Okay. So again, a suggestion, any thoughts from the sponsor or from the committee? I think that's a, that's well placed. And I also think we should take out daily virtual because uh, I'm completely <laughs> unaware of any such plans. And so we don't want to oversell it. And continuing with virtual celebrations and recognitions. Yeah, the month. I know it's awkward, but it is the pandemic, you know? Yeah. Okay. To make it clear to people, we're not trying to put them in a room together. Exactly. So we've made a- Pat, please. No, okay. Um, so can I make a motion? Yes, please. Um, I move to declare the Black History Month proclamation for 2021 as clear, consistent, and actionable as amended. Second. And Lynn seconds. So we have a motion that's been seconded. I'm going to move immediately to a vote. And I'm just going to go by my screen. Uh, Pat. Yes. Lynn. Yes. Uh, Mandy? Yes. Mandy? Yes. And the chair is a yes, so it is 5-0 unanimous. Um, the proclamation is declared clear, consistent, and actionable. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks for, for speaking up, Alyssa. Yeah. No. Thanks for taking the time to make it more publicized. Thank you. <laughs> so we have the MLK resolution, and if we could put that up again, I'm going to, I have a tracked version, but again, I can't put it up because my computer won't let me today. So Mandy would be kind enough to do that. Here I did have uh, one or two concerns with wording. Um, and I believe that the version that we were given is a somewhat older version. So I'll be curious to see what the version I'm working with is one that Mandy actually spent a fair amount of time on once upon a time. And then I think what we got was something older. So I'm gonna be curious to see what, what we've got in front of us, what she has, it looks like what I have. Um, yes, proclamation has an A, that would be nice. Um, our uh, council our clerk caught that, thank goodness, when it went public, that the GOL document did. Um, I have no changes and Mandy has uh, caught the one in the third whereas, there's a slight uh, problem with punctuation, she's caught that. Again, the ands do not have commas. Uh, sorry, Pat. Um, so we take, <laughs> take those out. Um, the, sorry, Mandy? I was gonna say the fourth one is where I, you see some things here. Um, I tried to make it one sentence because <laughs> that's what we try to do, one sentence per whereas. Yeah, that's George's idea. <laughs> yeah, and, and that is um, what we had actually in um, the version I'm looking at. Um, whereas that is a single sentence and we break it. And then another whereas, whereas Dr. King once said. Oh, so you, well, you broke I, it I, here? That's, that, that's what I did, but let's look at what you have. Um, maybe we can leave it as a single unit. I know some people don't mind it. So. Uh, Souls I Purpose, Path to Happiness and Greatness, once saying is what you suggested. Okay, that's okay. Life's most persistent, urgent question is what are we doing here, which led communities across the country. Um, I can live with that. In my version, I broke it up into two, but I have no problem with that. Is Pat our sponsor? Yes, yes that's fine. Pat, okay. Pat okay with that? Yeah. Okay. And you don't have to ask about the commas and all that. <laughs> I, I like doing that, Pat. That's I know. Fun. Um, and so the next whereas, I have no problem, and nor does Mandy. Again, people just speak up here. If you if we're missing something. In the now therefore, it needs to say the January 15th. 
January 18th is the actual holiday, but there, the bell ringing is happening on the 15th. And that means the final statement, the virtual bell ringing also will be on the 15th. So are we declaring the 15th the day to recognize Dr. Martin Luther King or keeping that the 18th and doing the bell ringing on the 15th? Are they both 15? Well, the 18th is his actual, the actual holiday. The actual we need to leave that as 18th. 15th is his birthday, correct? Yeah. And the 18th is the actual holiday. Right. So, so now I'm really confused. Right. Yeah. He was um, born on January 15th, and this year it coincides the bell ring happens to fall on his birthday. Because if, it, because if the holiday was Monday the 15th, it would be falling on a different day. So the holiday is the 18th, but right. he was, I, don't... I guess the question is which dates do these read? The bell ringing is the 18th on Monday or is no, it on his birthday? the bell birthday? ringing is on the 15th. On his birthday. Because town is closed, so there's nobody to ring the bells. Okay, so that's on Friday the 15th. Yes, yes. But are we so, proclaiming the 18th as the day? I don't know which way. Amherst Town Council proclaim January 18th, 2020 as the holiday recognizing. Uh, I don't like that wording. I, I don't know. I like as a day to recognize and remember. Oh, okay. yeah, I don't know. I, 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 I don't like the word holiday either, but I'm trying to distinguish what it is. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah. I understand that. I, and I mean, really, we don't want to proclaim holidays or declare holidays. I mean, at least this one, because it's a federal holiday. Right. Um, what we're proclaiming is, you know, the, celebrating the day, recognizing, remembering Dr. King. So I um, think we keep the 18th as the day because that's the federal holiday. Right. And then the 15th is the ceremony. And you can see I tried to reword it. Um, based on my experience with the Human Rights Day proclamation where that committee did not want it advertised as a big gathering. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, this one had a please join us for it. Um, is it gonna be a virtual bell ringing? As far as I know. What does the word virtual mean? It, are we not going on the steps of town hall? To are, we, read? Are, are we actually ringing a bell? Yes, we are. So what does virtual add? Right. right, it doesn't. Well, there the serum, yeah. I mean, I, I well, took it to mean there's going to be a, a, a Zoom ceremony and there's somebody's going to be bringing a bell in the background. Right. I, I, but this sounds like we're actually going to get it. I apologize, I don't know. So are we, we're not gathering on the steps of town hall? No, we're not. Oh, okay, so well, then. I'm not sure Pat knows for sure. No, I apologize. I I That's sort right. of went with what was sent to me. Um, I don't believe it's it possible, or, or Lynn, you think it would be possible or not? Uh, I personally think it's an inappropriate for us to encourage anybody to gather. Right. Okay. Then let's Given get the, yeah. Okay, so we're getting rid of that one, and then we can do the please join us in a virtual ceremony. Right. In reading of the proclamation. And reading of the record. proclamation. Which, which will include be, a bell ringing or something? Well, maybe we'll just leave the bell ringing out, which will be yeah. held on that date. And if there's a bell ringing, fine. If there isn't, fine. But it's mainly that it's going to be a virtual event and it will involve reading the proclamation. Please join us in a virtual cer ceremony and reading of the proclamation. Okay. In honor of Dr. Martin Luther King on, in Friday, a movie, on January Friday, 15th. January 15th at 4.30 p.m. I move that we adopt. Before you go, um, getting back to that uh, last whereas clause question in the 18th, and the other thing you could do is now, therefore, we the town council recognize that January 18th is a holiday or a national holiday to recognize and remember. Um, we don't proclaim it, but we recognize that it is the national holiday. I think we've always proclaimed it in accordance with the national holiday. Right. Right. We're, we're, yeah. Okay. Yeah. 
let's leave it alone so we can vote on this. Well, sorry, okay. Andy. It's all right. No, it's, that's fine. Oh, this should probably read Reverend Doctor. That is correct. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'd like to move that we adopt, we declare the proclamation regarding Martin Luther King Day clear, consistent, and actionable. Is there a second? Second. Andy seconds, and Lynn has made the motion. Um, this as amended, as revised here today. So um, if there's no further discussion, I'm going to move directly to vote and I'm going to begin this time um, with Lynn. Aye. And Mandy? Aye. Mandy? Aye. The chair is an aye. Patricia? Aye. All right, it's five zero, unanimous. Declare this proclamation, the MLK proclamation to be clear, consistent, and actionable. Mandy, as you've done many, many times in the past, you will um, send this both to uh, Athena and a copy to me. Yep. Thank you very much. All right. Um, it is now 1223. Um, we're clearly going to run over, I think, but I think, um, and I'm, this is open to discussion, it's worth um, our commitment of time and energy now so that we can present uh, a candidate to the uh, council at the next council meeting. So um, I'd like to open the discussion uh, of the three candidates to the committee with the hope that we can come to a vote um, sometime in the next 30 minutes or maybe even less, um, but depends on how the discussion goes. So that's where I'd like to go next um, in terms of the agenda. Seeing no objection, that's what we're gonna do. And I'm gonna open the floor uh, to the committee and uh, anyone who'd like to begin the discussion. Again, we've been blessed with three remarkable candidates and uh, you always wish there were three openings, uh, but they're not, there's only one. Um, I believe we have agreed, my understanding is we've agreed to make this a position for one and a half years. So um, it would be, so it would terminate, it would be a position that would end in June Help me here, June 20, what would it be? 2023, is that 2022. right? 2022. So we're talking about um, whatever we finally decide today in terms of the individual, the term would end in June, 2022. It'd be a year and a half. Anyone like to start the discussion? I can start with a couple of uh, just a couple of observations. First of all, I think that we do have three excellent candidates, and uh, so I, there's nobody who I would say is not qualified in the group. Two of them um, are people who uh, have a strong interest in represent a constitu uh, a rep represent residents in a very good way and have some expertise. The one that I find most interesting in some ways because of a very special um, set of expertise is uh, Mr. Halloway. And it is because of his education background and just recognizing that um, one of the things that um, uh, Mary Lou Talman had brought to the committee was her understanding of the education process and her background as an educational administrator and former member of the school committee and somebody who had spent a lot of time working on school budgets. And um, that contribution to the committee was valuable because um, she had such an expect exceptional interest and background in the area. And uh, that's um, sort of the one thing we're missing by not having her 
uh, as a member of the committee, though, I think that it was, you know, we made the right decision last time, not going back on that, but Mr. Halloway sort of brings that back to the committee, if chosen. But uh, I think that all three are excellent candidates. I, I would just follow up on that and and concur that um, you know both that you know we have three great candidates to choose from, uh, but given um, the potential, given the results or what we heard at the four towns meeting um, just a couple weeks ago, and the concerns I have about regional budgets this year, um, regional assessment, regional budgets, the negotiations that surround that, um, declining school enrollments um, and how that affects budgets both for the schools, both, both sets of school budgets, but also that then impending potential impact on town operating budgets and capital budgets. Um, Mr. Holloway's sort of experience in schools and even with DESE, even if it's sort of in a related area, um, definitely piques my interest as something that might be very valuable on this committee for particularly this budget season. Uh, I agree about the strengths of the candidates. Um, and uh, I think Matt Holloway seems like a very interesting potential candidate. I'm least uh, encouraged by his response around racial equity and analyzing impacts um, where he's willing, it seems like he was articulate and willing to look at the impacts of other kinds of decisions but was stepping back from that one. And that made me a little uncomfortable, to be honest. Um, I think he may be the strongest candidate, even with that. Um, but I'm, that's where I'm hesitating. You know, I think for me, the challenge always is balancing the very real experience, background, knowledge that, that individuals bring with the role or place of outreach of, of people having a way to have their voices heard on such an important committee. Um, these are non-voting members and um, I guess I agree completely with the previous comments by both of my colleagues that Mr. Holloway has extraordinary experience and background and knowledge and the schools at this time and place are really important. But we're also uh, wrestling with the uh, a larger issue as a community in terms of making sure that everyone is heard and all voices feel like they have a way to be heard and finance is, is an extremely important body. Um, and so I'm really torn here between a candidate that I think um, would be an excellent uh, choice in terms of, of giving voice to, uh, or at least an opportunity for people to give voice and raise concerns on finance that I, I think uh, uh, is unique. So. I really, I'm, I'm really torn. Um, I think, yeah, I don't know what people's thoughts are on that, but um, how much expertise do we need? How much, I mean, I don't know, maybe uh, the finance, we have three members of finance here, so you uh, certainly bring uh, a much better sense of this. How important is it, do you think, that um, there be a place for a voice or voices that are not usually heard on a finance committee. 
Georgia, I think you have absolutely, um, for me, crystallized, if you will, or captured um, my dilemma. Okay, um, I I think all can all of the candidates are well qualified. I think Mr. Holloway is particularly well qualified uh, when it comes to issues as it relates to the schools. Yeah. And I do know that we have, not having Mary Lou is missing a voice on the non-voting member side that particularly knows the schools. This is the classic dilemma. It is so much of an issue of do we take um, someone who may have um, ability to relate to other parts of the population and bring them on the committee, even though they don't have the background around schools, which by the way, nobody else on the finance committee has that level of background, nobody. I mean, Andy is closest and it's because he's worked on the town council. So uh, you, you just captured it. It's an issue of whether or not we break with going with, frankly, the person who is probably most qualified for immediately being able to ramp up to the issues. And that is, in my mind, clearly Matt Holloway versus bringing in someone who has relationships in communities that we don't necessarily have the outreach that they do. I'm, I'm torn. And in a way it also, it, it's, it's deja vu all over again. Um, this was a very similar argument that I was on the other side of last time. Mm -hmm. um, but now I feel that, that um, I'm leaning more towards the, the position that I eventually uh, did not agree with last time um, that, and it's difficult and painful because uh, the, the school's issue is really important. And, and, but I do think it's really important that, um, that we show and the town, you know, uh, ex, you know makes real um, a place for other voices to be heard. Um, now, I don't want to put that candidate on the spot either. In the end, it's a finance committee. Um, it's not a bully pulpit. Um, it's, a, it's a place that has some very rigorous and, and, and pressing demands on it. So that's, I guess, another concern I have is that, but this is true for anybody, um, but uh, the, the, just the, the demands that this places on anyone who serves on it, um, especially as they're coming up to speed, but even if they are up to speed, um, as Andy and the others of you know very well, is quite real. So, um, but it feels like the same argument we had a number of months ago, um, where, um, and I'm beginning, I'm feeling myself leaning towards the other way this time, um, that that this, this value of uh, expanding a bit the, the uh, the perspectives of, of the non-resident members, or non, excuse me, non-voting members um, outweighs the very real contributions that Mr. Holloway would bring right from the get-go. So it's, again, I wish there were two positions, but they're not. Um, so that's where I'm stuck. And I'm leaning toward um, favoring uh, Ms. Scheffler because of that argument. What are people's thoughts? I mean, there two, there, there's arguments on both sides here. There's no right or wrong. Um, and... So I, I find myself in an interesting dilemma because as, as with George, um, my initial comments today are the opposite of what I made <laughs> six months ago, <laughs> um, um, where I, I argued for and and I you know I I I can support either. Um, 
you know, there is something very valuable to be said, as I said, six months ago for um, bringing in people that may not have the exact experience we're looking for, but have the potential to gain that experience through service on the finance committee, but also bring something else, which is that connection to community and that real, what we've seen um, in, in Michelle, Ms. Scheffler indicate that real um, desire and excitement around getting new voices and talking to new voices um, about budgets and stuff. Um, you know, the other thing that, as George was saying, hit me in terms of issue, as I'm really concerned with regarding regional budgets, regional assessments, and all of that, that may be more of a political issue that we as elected officials just have to deal with. Um, and it may not be something we would want to put on the non-political resident appointees. It might just be something that we as the elected officials have to just, you know, sort of suck up and say, this is, this is our road, you know, our burden to bear in terms of the, the disputes, potential disputes, the, the, you know, the, the con potential contention that may be happen, may happen regarding, you know, cross purposes between the council and either a regional district or the not the school department, um, as it is when we deal with, you know, Paul and the town managers cross purposes with where we might be thinking. Um, and so maybe that leans towards supporting Ms. Scheffler anyway, um, even though you know that experience would be brought from someone that might not be the position we want to put a non, you know, a non-political sort of person in potentially. I mean, I noticed that both of the candidates, it seems that are, are sort of in a sense that the, that the one and two position um, are new to town. Um, they clearly bring a lot of energy and excitement. Both of them do. Both of them have been engaged in other town committees or commissions. So right from the get-go, they've been interested and curious about Amherst, wanting to be engaged. Um, so in that regard, that certainly stands out they both equally represent those values, um, which I think are extremely important. Um, so, and I guess I, 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 I yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, if I were to hear, if I were to hear from the members of the finance committee that given what they're facing uh, over the next few months. Um, given who's already serving on this body, the two other uh, non-voting resident members, that they really feel that having a third member um, who has this kind of background and expertise, um, particularly related to schools um, and the issues related to government, town government and schools is absolutely essential for, it really be very valuable for them um, then I could be swayed the other way. But I, at the moment, I'm feeling that the value of, 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 of the community connection that, you know, um, I think would be, I, I think that just takes at the moment that's leading the, the, the pack for me, leading the list of, of, of criteria. So I need to hear uh, if anyone has a strong feeling about that. Uh, I'd like to hear it. Uh -huh. um, I'm sorry, um, Pat, please go ahead, Pat. No, I'm not sure I want to speak, but I'm sitting here wrestling. We're talking about two candidates. There were three candidates mm -hmm. um, and um, each of them is experienced in, in ways. And I guess I, I want to, uh, In terms of transparency, it feels to me that I need to say that the reason that uh, Mr. Kim is not one of the people I'm wrestling with is because I felt like uh, it was it was difficult to understand uh, some of his responses, and I just want to be upfront about that because we're not, um, and that doesn't. 
it doesn't negate his experience, nor does it negate his abilities, but it does seem to me to be problematic uh, at this time. And I just, I just want to say that, and I feel, um, I don't know. I mean, I, and I, I apologize for not knowing exactly where I'm going with this, but I, but it, uh, I, I think we need to say clearly why we are supporting or not supporting a particular candidate. And I, of the two that are uh, Ms. Scheffler and Mr. Holloway, I'm really not sure who I want to support. Um, so that that's interesting to me, but I just, I don't know. I'm going to be quiet. I think that what... Uh... You can go, Andy. Um, thinking about uh, what Mary Lou was doing on the committee and why she was um, valuable is that we get submitted to us a budget from the school committee that um, is a budget of, about educational um, administration. And she had experience in that and was able to ask interesting and hard questions. And I think that because none of us on the committee have been in that role before, it makes it more, you know, we don't have anybody who has that background. I think that uh, Halloway brings that, plus he's a parent of a child who's coming into the school uh, system. So he has an interest in it. Um, Ms. Scheffler, I think, has a lot of strengths that have been put forward very, uh, very articulately too. She doesn't have that ability to ask the hard budget questions that none of us uh, really have an equal plane on, but uh, she certainly, I think, has a touch to the community in a different way and has shown an interest in becoming involved in the community. So it's a, it's a hard one. I, I can see both as contributors. I just wanted to, you know, Pat, Pat said, you know, in the interest of transparency, um, you know, while Mr. Kim is quite qualified, I wasn't convinced with the answers given that, um, that that outreach that Ms. Scheffler talked about loving and being able to do was similar, that, that, that Mr. Kim could do something similar or bring something like that to it. And, um, Similarly, you know, the experience that he provides is much different than the experience that Mr. Holloway would provide. Um, and I just find Mr. Holloway's experience more relevant at this point in time. Um, that there is also the concern that um, there seemed to be a lot of concentration from Mr. Kim on building a new school and large capital projects instead of the overall sort of picture um, for the town. Um, and I, I think I'm looking for someone on the finance committee from a resident point of view that, ha that has less um, one, I guess, one alley. Um, and, and that just came across to me in his answers as being much more of the focus. And I'd like someone who's focused a little more broadly. I still don't know. Um, I'm between Ms. Scheffler and Mr. Holloway though. Lynn, please. Um, I have to say, uh, in fairness to um, Ms. Scheffler, is that the fact that we interviewed her before and I have very strong and um, seriously good memories of her previous interview is resting in my mind. It was a much more robust interview. It was a much more, a frankly, passionate interview. Uh, and I got a much greater sense of her ability to 
look at financial issues and um, tear them apart. But all of that was from her previous interview. It was not from this interview. Uh, having said that, uh, you can't dismiss what you've already seen in a public meeting about someone from the past. So I just, again, this is in the light of transparency. If somebody only looked at this interview, they might wonder what we saw. But in fact, I had have to consider both interviews. Um, Mandy Jo actually brought up the previous interview and something was stated during that previous interview. So I just wanna, for the sake, sake of the public discussion, recognize that there was a previous interview and uh, there are things that at least I and I think other people on this committee saw during that previous interview. That in no way diminishes the um, school knowledge that Mr. Um, Matt, uh, that Matt brings. Um, I, I hesitate to say this. Um, I've never been on a school committee but I have a doctorate in education and took a course in school finance. And if you want me to tear, tear apart the school budget, I will. I'm hesitant to do that because we have a superintendent of schools and a school committee that comes to us. When we're ready to analyze that school budget, I'll take it on. Okay. You heard that here first, folks. So, Thanks. And it was recorded <laughs> so we can we can play it back at some point later. That does not, I don't want to put up my knowledge against. No, of course, I understand. No. By any, his is much more current and it's yeah. much more uh, related to uh, the present day school budgets and in Massachusetts. But I just, um, I also knowing other counselors and on the finance committee and their ability to look at school budgets. Um, I'm not as concerned about that issue uh, although I fully and completely uh, appreciated what um, Mary Lou brought to the Finance Committee. So, um, we could sit here for another 10 or 15 minutes looking at each other in Zoom space. Um, but I, I think we pretty much sketched out the, the, the core argument or the, the issue that we're wrestling with. And um, I'm certainly willing to entertain any new thoughts, but my sense is that we are, and I think Lynn put something very important, uh, it's true for me, that a previous interview is also playing a role here and acknowledging that at least one of the interviewees was, was it was 7.30 in the morning. Um, and uh, there was also sounds in the background that might explain why she had hadn't had much sleep in the last 24 hours. So it clearly was not the, the interview that we had before, but I think there's some very obvious reasons why that's the case. Um, so I'm still leaning toward um, Ms. Scheffler. Is, I haven't heard anything yet that, that leads me away from that. Um, though I still wish we had two positions to fill. We don't. Shall we have a straw vote? What do people want to do? I think we should go ahead and vote. So I'm going to um, make the motion that we appoint or we recommend, excuse me, thank you, <laughs> watch my language, that we recommend to the town council that the town council appoints uh, Jane Scheffler to a period of one and a half years that will um, end in June, 2022 uh, as a non-voting uh, resident member of the town council finance committee. Second. So a motion has been made and seconded. Um, any further comment, thought?
I guess I would say no matter how this vote goes, um, I encourage all three candidates um, to continue expressing their interest in town government um, and service and you know filling out activity forms um, for positions that they find some interest in. Absolutely, I just point out for the public and anyone who might view this at some later date that um, their applications for FinCom will stay active for the next three years. So um, we will, uh, maybe not this chair or this person, but this body, GOL, will be um, having further um, positions to fill for FinCom. And when that does happen, um, all these candidates um, will be notified again for the next three years. And we have another reappointment coming up in July. We have one coming up in July. So they will be notified um, whether they choose to apply again, of course, is, is up to them. But I hear you, Mandy, and I certainly will communicate to them um, our desire that they stay engaged and active. Any other thoughts? Otherwise, I'm going to move to a vote. And um, this time, I guess I will begin with uh, Mandy. Aye. Pat. I can come back to you, Pat, if you wish. You don't, if you want to. Um, I I'm can sorry, come back I didn't to you. realize I was muted. Nay. Nay. Okay. Uh, Andy. Aye. Um, Lynn? Aye. Um, and the chair is an aye. So the motion is carried. A four yes, one opposed to um, recommend to the town council that Jane Scheffler be appointed for a term to expire in June 2022, June 30th, 2022, to be precise. Um, Pat, you can reach out to me later if you wish, but you also can make it now. Is there something in particular you'd like me to say about your nay vote, or would you like it simply to be registered and that's sufficient? Uh, I think that's sufficient. Okay, fine. At this time, if, I, don't, I really don't think there's... I understand. That's fine. All right. Um, I'd like to adopt the GOL calendar. Um, you've had a chance to look at it. We talked about it last time. I haven't made any real changes. I think the one change I made was simply to, to, to suggest that the January uh, date uh, in uh, 2022 is, is suggested. It's just a, it's an option. Um, and obviously we can change the calendar at any point. Um, so I would just like to adopt it and uh, send it on to Athena for uh, posting as of the new year. Uh, there's no super rush, but we don't meet again until January 6th. Um, so I'd like to um, have that voted on today if people are amenable. I move to adopt the proposed GOL calendar for 2021. Second. And Pat seconds, okay. I'm gonna go directly to a vote. Um, Lynn? Aye. Andy? Aye. Uh, Mandy? Aye. Yeah. And I think I heard I and the chair is an I. So it's five zero um, unanimous. We're going to adopt that calendar. I will send it to Athena and it will get put up uh, in January as our calendar for 2021. Um, I'm not gonna deal with update on bylaws for future consideration, uh, but I have promised solemnly to the town council that every single meeting that we have, it will be on the agenda and it will be leading the agenda next time. Uh, I hope, though, who knows. Um, no items unanticipated by the chair that he's aware of. Um, discussion of future agenda items. We still do have one attendee. I don't know if there's so one member of the public um, is Councillor Brewer, as a matter of fact, and she's already spoken, but um, I believe if the public has anything they'd like to say, now's your chance to speak. Up. Uh, no, nope, there's no public presence, so that, that settles that. Um, no public comment today. 
future agenda items. Um, as I said, uh, we will continue to uh, do the update on bylaws for future consideration. Um, we've dealt with both of the proclamations, so that will not be an issue. We'll be returning to the timeline. Um, I don't know how people want to handle that. Um, it seems like we just have a lot of talking to do, a lot of thinking. Um, we have four different pressures or four different sort of masters that need to be served, and it's getting challenging to see how we can concoct one. So perhaps we'll just leave that as uh, that will be a discussion item on the agenda is the timeline following up on our discussion today. Um, anything else that, will, Lynn, do you see anything to us? Are we going to see yeah. the... Uh, uh, there was a two things. First of all, we are, I believe, required by our own rules of procedure to review them annually. And I think we need to find time to do that before our term expires. And the second is that uh, there was a memo from the town manager, yep. to the town council, that will appear on the next town council agenda on the 21st with potential referral to GOL, and it was to develop guidelines for how to do 8.1. I'm sorry to do... Manage 8.1, which is when residents would like to request a meeting with a elected body. Okay. The manager provided a recommendation to in this particular instance, and um, I, it turns out that um, the person interested in this has gone to the school committee and asked if they are willing to go along, but I think we need to take it up in GOL as a potential for potential inclusion in our rules of procedure. Okay. But it has to be referred first. Okay. Now I had tentatively put something in our packet and then I took it off the agenda. And I'm wondering just in terms of proper procedure, whether I, I got very nervous about it for other reasons. Eventually I took it off because of simple time constraints, but this was your, you had asked each individual counselor to respond to you COB. And I had already put it on our agenda for us to talk about as a group. Um, and eventually it got removed. Um, so it's not an issue, it's moot. But um, going forward, I guess I was a little confused how to proceed. I, Cause I really wanted to hear from my committee about um, this long list of like eight or 10 or 12 things that, that you were seeking comment back from individual counselors, but perhaps that was not appropriate that um, uh, for us to talk about it as a committee while you were still soliciting individual comments, COB. Um, any thoughts, anyone any thoughts on that? Um, and it didn't come up today because I took it off, but if this had been a normal meeting it would have been on there and I would have had all kinds of things I wanted to talk about and say, um, and that perhaps would be completely inappropriate um, from an open meeting law perspective or just from general council procedure perspective. But any thoughts quickly on that? George, just as an aside, um, are relevant to the memo. Depending on what the council does with it, it, each of those issues would then go to the respective committees. And then the respective committees can discuss them and recommend back to the council. Mm -hmm. hey, we think you should drop this item. Here's mm -hmm. a revision, or whatever, or you know, whatever the case may be. So, in terms, I I'm also out of time. Uh, in terms of um, having to give the feedback, it whether or not that happens today, this is not the last pass. Right. right. Exactly. <laughs> That's the best way to put it. I felt premature, I guess. When I thought about it afterwards, I thought I'm really jumping the gun. I should just wait. And so it got taken off anyway, but mm -hmm. um, I'll wait until it's referred to us and then we can take it up. That makes sense. You mentioned review of procedures, Len. Would you just clarify for me a moment? As, so we're doing the timeline. We're gonna do the town manager memo if it's referred to us on 8.1. Um, and I guess, what are we doing when we uh, review? I mean, just going through what? Help me here. I'm in the process of trying to come up with a list of everything we need to do between now and the end of December 
2021. And I believe if we check the rules of procedure, we right. review them once a year. And so Good. that is a GOL responsibility. So our charge, it's not in the rules, it's in the GOL charge is to annually review the town council. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. I just so, looked up the charge. Right, it's in, right, it's in our charge. Be good for me to read that occasionally. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> so that's three items right there. Uh, and definitely review of, our, of the rules procedure will be uh, on the agenda. Um, and the timeline will be on the agenda. Anything else that people would like to have on the agenda or foresee coming to us on January 6th? No. I'm not going to invite Paul. I don't see any point at this at this stage. We still have some more discussing to do. But at some point, I would certainly invite him back. Um, just FYI, um, and if he wants to, then he'd be he'd be welcome to come. Yeah. All right, that's all I have. Um, we'll see you all Monday night. Um, thank you all for your hard work, and Thanks, I, I will reach out to the UEs uh, and and tell them what has been resolved, and I'll prepare the report for Monday night. So the meeting is adjourned officially at. At 103 is what I have. Thanks. Thank you. See ya. Bye. Bye. Bye.